Welcome to the second evening of the Tejas Storytelling Association's Virtual Conference 2020, Storytelling in the Time of Corona. Whether you've been able to sign on to partake of every course of this feast of stories thus far, or if you are joining us for the first course, we are glad to have you with us. Once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors for the event and like to thank you for joining us. As I was reflecting on the theme of storytelling in the time of Corona, funny thing, but the image of a buffet came to mind. <laughs> funny, I would think about a buffet or think about food because there's sure been a lot of thinking about and partaking of that during COVID for sure and some of us have the pounds to show it. But more than just a pleasant pastime, eating is a necessary thing. It brings us pleasure and it nourishes us, as do stories. And like going to a great buffet, we can assure you this evening that you will find something delightful on the menu and truly satisfying to the palate. Before we begin the stories though, I'd like to introduce our sign, our interpreters for the evening, Libby Tipton and Joel Hill. And also, if you'd like to watch or see the signer, the interpreter, as you are listening to the storyteller, then you want to put your device on gallery view and you'll be able to see them side by side. So now we invite you to sit back, relax, enjoy this first course. Our first storyteller is the featured storyteller of the evening. And yeah, it may look that we're doing it in reverse order, but because of the distance and the time between us, we found it necessary to do so. For this first teller, We'll take a trip across the pond. Shauna Lay, a storyteller from the United Kingdom, Shauna Lay Combers, is a Jewish, and I'm going to try to tell this, but Shauna is, I'm surely going to have to correct me on it. She's a Jewish drutzala from the Yiddish oral tradition. We are blessed indeed. Not everyone gets the chance to meet a Drutzela, let alone hear her stories. The tradition that she tells from was passed down from her grandmother who survived the Holocaust in the Auschwitz concentration camp, partly because she could tell stories. And just think, some people wonder about the power of storytelling. Shana Lay comes to us from the United Kingdom, thus the time difference, and has worked as a storyteller within the secular world for the past 22 years across the UK, Europe, Scandinavia, the US, and New Zealand. She has, you, she has been UK Deputy National Storytelling Laureate, served in that role in 2010 to 2012. She is a favorite at festivals and is soon to become one of yours. She's performed at festivals, in halls, on stages, and a variety of other venues where there have been eager and listening ears to hear. Shauna Lay has lectured about Jewish storytelling at the University of Derby in England and is a regular contributor to BBC arts programs. She was the United Kingdom's Deputy National Storytelling Laureate and has finished commissions for the British Library, the British Museum, and, the, and served at the Literature Festival. Without further ado, we welcome Shauna Lay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy, for such a, a glowing introduction. It's like, uh, that's a lot to live up to. I didn't realize I'd done so much. So it's a real treat to be here, uh, I think. Uh, there are blessings and curses and the time that we are living in is certainly interesting but 
the blessing is that we can listen to storytellers from all over the world and I get to be with you here. Uh, so um, I was wondering what story to tell you from the tradition and I thought that I'm going to tell you a story about wisdom and about luck and in my tradition um, the the story is led by the listeners now that's not possible in this case but it's traditional that you would say but that that is another story and the listeners would say for another time and if I think I have time to tell that story I'll get my husband to to be the audience stunt double and just interact on your behalf I hope that's all right so uh, the audience uh, in Texas will be speaking with a a very British accent this evening. So I'm going to begin by telling you the story of wisdom and luck. Shevatahim gam yachot Hinei mahatov Shevatahim gam yachot How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. In the year 547 Wisdom and luck stood outside the gates of the city of Borsippa and they were arguing. They were arguing about who was the bravest, who was the brightest, who was the cleverest, who was the best looking. And as that argument went backwards and forwards, they couldn't decide. And so it was decided that a, a wager would take place. They would enter in to one of the children in the city. But who would be the first to enter the child? And so a coin was tossed. <laughs> and as luck would have it, <laughs> wisdom won. Now, in that city a boy was born. And with his first breath, wisdom entered into him. Oh, that boy. He was so clever. He could run before he could talk. He could sing before he could walk. And they would say that there was a boy that shouldn't be able to do that. But this lad could. And they would say that such a fine, clever boy should be a scholar. But his parents were poor. They couldn't afford for him to, to go to the schools. And so it was decided that he would become apprentice, an apprentice to the goldsmith of the city of Borsippa. And so Darius, for that was his name, started his apprenticeship when he was seven years old. Every day his job was to make sure that each craftsman had enough precious metal to work his art. Every day the bellows were in good repair. Every day the fire was hot enough for the craftsmen to create their works of wonder. And as he worked, as his job, he watched. And as he watched, because he was bright, he was quick, he was clever, he learnt. And eventually Darius himself began to fashion trinkets, jewels, all manner of wonders. But you know how it is? The goldsmith took all of the credit. Well, what would happen was this. People would come and marvel at the work and, and they would say, is it all your own work? And he would say, of course it's all my own work. And Darius, listening at the back, would think, well, that's not very fair. And he remembered his mother saying that a man should not stay where he is not treated fairly. And so, though not quite a young man, still a, a boy but not an infant, at the age of 12 years old, 
Darius set his foot to the floor, his face to the sky and his soul to the future and he began to walk. He took with him a, a little bread and a little water and he walked and walked and he began to wonder if he would ever, ever find another city where he could work. But after some time, he reached the great city of Ur. He sat down when he reached the city and he watched people going backwards and forwards. You could always find someone that needed help if you watched. And the person that he watched most was the tailor. Now that tailor was scurrying backwards and forwards with bolts of cloth and then running backwards and forwards with orders and tape measures around his neck and he thought, that man needs an assistant. And so he went later that afternoon to the tailor's shop and he knocked on the door. And the tailor opened it and Darius said, My friend, if you took me on, to be your assistant, I would make garments that would make poor people look rich. There would be a market for those. If you took me on to be your assistant, I would make garments that would make fat people look thin. And there would definitely be a market for those. If you took me on, I could make garments that would make politicians look honest. There might even be a market for that, who knows? And the tailor said, of course I'll take you on. How much experience have you got? And Darius had to be honest and he said, absolutely none whatsoever. But there was something in the boy's face. And so that is how Darius became the tailor's assistant in the city of Ur. And again, he was diligent at his work. He stitched, he sewed, and true to his word, he created garments that made that tailor's fame spread. And when those shops were full, one day came floating that phrase to his ear. Did you make all these garments yourself? Oh, yes, said the tailor. It's all my own work. Darius thought, I must be the unluckiest boy in the world. First, I have no luck. I no, get no credit. I will not stay here a moment longer. And for the second time in his life, he, now 17 summers old, set his foot to the road, his face to the sky and his soul to the future. And off he walked, with a flask of water and a loaf of bread, but the way was longer and further than he had ever thought. His water ran out, and his bread ran out, and his belly rumbled. He was so hungry. And then his lips became cracked, his tongue swelled up. He thought he was about to die. And then he saw a mirage. He saw open gates and a fountain of water trickling. Oh, and he was sure that it was just a mirage, but better to die in that illusion than in this desert. And so he crawled hand over hand until he came into that courtyard and he plunged his face into that fountain and he expected to be met with dry, gritty sand. But it was water, beautiful, clear, crystal water. He drank and drank until his belly ached. And then he sat down and he watched. There were no goldsmiths in the city of Susa, for that is where he was. And there were no tailors, for you see, the city of Susa was a city of words, of leaders, of kingship. He watched all day and as dusk fell and the stars came out and the moon began to rise he sat and he noticed that the marketplace filled up with people and they began to tell stories for it was also a place of story and it was there that he heard the strangest tale of all the story of a princess who never spoke 
and whose father, the very king of Susa, would give her hand, hopefully the rest of her as well, in marriage to whoever made her speak. Well, thought Darius, how hard can it be to make a woman speak? <laughs> he was very young and naive, ladies. He didn't understand. And so the following morning, he put his pack on his back and he set off to the king's palace. And he was shown to a waiting room by an old, old guard who looked at this boy, this youth, with his dusty beggar's velvet. That guardsman, he went and he called the king. And the king came down and everybody hid. And he looked at this boy and he said, you think you can make my daughter speak? I think I can, said Darius, for there's nothing so optimistic as youth. There is a Jewish saying, it's let your teeth stop your words. I don't know if you know it. And, and that means when you're born, obviously you have no teeth, for you say nothing foolish. And then they grow, usually as soon as you start talking, because that's when you start talking foolery. And then, of course, you lose them when you get old again, because you've learnt that wisdom and you don't need them any more. But the king looked, and he looked at this foolish young boy, and he said, I have to warn you, young man, the penalty for failure is death. And for a moment, Darius looked, and he said, Oh, my king, look at me. I have nothing, nothing left to lose. And so Darius was shown to the princess's apartment and a guard was placed outside to witness the momentous event, should it ever happen. In he went. And there he looked around that apartment, more beautiful than anything he'd ever seen. And there he saw, there was the back of a beautiful woman. She was standing on the balcony overlooking the city and her hair was long and flowing, braided and cradled and oh, she was beautiful. He could tell even though she didn't turn round. <clears throat> he cleared his throat. She never turned round. Hello, he said, hopefully. She didn't speak. And then he realised, I'm a fool. I am a fool. <laughs> My mother always told me you can never make a woman do something she doesn't want to. Why didn't I listen to my mother? That's the point you can tell it's a Jewish story, by the way. And so he looked around the room for inspiration. And that's when he saw it. He saw a silver menorah. A menorah if you don't know, is a seven-branched candlestick. We use it for high days, holy days, and it's also really good for power cuts. He saw that menorah, and he saw, I might be a fool, but I'm a lucky fool. And so he walked over to that menorah, and in a loud voice, he told that menorah of a story of its cousin, in the city of Ur. But that, as we say, is another story another time. Okay, and I'm going to tell you that because we have time to tell you. In the city of Ur, there were two families, one rich and one poor. The Goldbergs, let's say, were the rich family, and Feldmans were poor. They were blow-ins, you understand. We say blow-in if somebody is from a, a, a different place. And the Feldmans have a daughter, and she is getting married. And they don't have much, but they have good friends. And they have borrowed a fine tablecloth. They've borrowed rich crockery. Mrs. Feldman even approves of her son-in-law, which, believe me, for a Jewish mother, almost impossible. But there's one thing they don't have, which is traditional. They don't have a silver menorah to sit at the head of the wedding feast. Mr. Feldman turns to his wife. For the Goldbergs have one, but they will not lend you anything. Everything must be paid for, and they don't have money. He says, my wife, do you trust me? She says, I've been married to you for 35 years. Of course I trust you. Then he says, I will get you your silver menorah. He goes to the house, 
and he goes round to the servants' quarters, knocks on the door, and the little maid opens the door, and Mr. Fellman says, look, I hope you don't mind, but I was wondering if you had a teacup, any old teacup that you could lend. Please, you'd be doing me a great favour. And the woman looks and she's about to throw out a chip teacup and he looks such a nice man. What harm could it do? So the teacup is lent. And three days later he brings it back. In this hand a chip teacup, in this hand a beautiful little coffee cup. You'll never believe it, he says, but from the other night, from the cupboard, a, a, a moaning, a groaning, a terrible noise and the teacup gave birth. <laughs> so I'm giving them both back to you. And she, so stunned, could only nod her head, said, By the way, could I borrow a milk jug? And it's Lent. Three days later, he comes back not only with a milk jug, but a little cream jug. From there came a moaning, a groaning from that cupboard. Such a moaning and a groaning. And when I opened the cupboard... Your milk jug had given birth. Now, I know one should never separate a mother from its child. <laughs> so I'm giving them both back to you. And with that, before he had time to say anything, she had closed the door in his face, gathered her skirts, run to her mistress and said, Mistress, mistress, the crockery is giving birth. Really, she said. That's amazing. We'll never have to buy another. Oh, <coughs> Muzzle tough. We'll never have to buy another piece again. She was so excited she sneezed. Well, let me know if the funny little man comes back. And of course he did, three days later. But this time he asked for the silver menorah. Normally the maid would have shown him the door, but not this time. She went and asked her mistress, and her mistress said, Lend it. You never know. It's silver. It might have twins. <laughs> So the menorah was lent, and the menorah was polished, and it sat at the head of that wedding feast, and it burnt so brightly, it had never had so much fun. And all the while, they waited in the big house the return of the silver menorah. It didn't happen, not after three days, not after seven or fourteen. Maybe silver takes longer, thought the maid, but eventually her mistress sent her to the house. She knocked on the door, and when she opened it, there was Mr. Feldman. I've been meaning to come and tell you, but such sad news, I didn't know how to break it. But from the cupboard, there came a moaning, a groaning, a terrible noise, and I opened the cupboard door, and your menorah has died, and handed her a small piece of silver tin. She ran back to her mistress, said, the menorah has died. She says, I, I haven't even told my husband there's been a birth in the family and now there's a death. And so she tells her husband. He looks her up and looks her down and wondered why he ever married her. You foolish woman. He takes the whole thing to court, but the, the judge is a fair man. He says, if you believe that a teacup can give birth. And if you're foolish enough to believe that a milk jug can give birth, then the only ruling I can give in this case is you have to believe that a menorah can die. Case dismissed. Which is why, said Darius, to the menorah on the cupboard in the room of the princess, there is a relative of yours in the poor quarter of the city of Ur, and anyone may borrow it whenever they have a wedding or they celebrate, providing they bring it back after 14 days. He turned. She still hadn't spoken, but she had turned slightly, enough that he could see that her eyes were glistening, and her mouth slightly upturned and winning, he thought. Now he racked his brains, and with that he saw a shaft of sunlight, and that sunlight lay upon the fur of a cat that was stretching and sleeping. He had another idea. He knelt, ignoring the princess, 
and saying, I bet your mistress looks after you. I bet your mistress cares for your every need. Let me tell you the story of the scholar who thought that the Creator provided everything. And this is the story that Darius told the cat. But that is another story which I also have time to tell you. It's almost like I planned it, isn't it? The story that Darius told the cat went like this. A long time ago, in a city, there was a great scholar, and every day he would go in and teach his pupils. He would teach them letters, he would teach them algebra, he would teach them to study, and as their day got hotter and hotter, they got more and more frazzled. But the one thing that he did teach them is, he who is above will provide all of your needs. Now, when he had been a young and impetuous young man, that scholar had saved a, uh, a dibuk called Hobya from a musician that knew the note that had the power to kill. And some of us still know musicians like that to this day. And Hobya, for no dibuk, likes to be in debt. Well, he had often tried to find a way to pay back his human benefactor. And so sometimes he would say, why do you work so hard? I enjoy teaching. If you believe that the Creator provides everything, why do you go into the classroom every day? Well, he didn't want to answer that one. But one day, when he was teaching, I don't know why, maybe it was too hot, maybe the students were just a little too boisterous, but he had had enough and he quit. He walked out of the classroom, he walked down to the river, he put his back against a tree, he sat by the river, and as always he had talked, he waited for the Creator to provide. Nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. And nothing happened was slower than Hobya had wanted it to happen. He had a plan, you see, he wanted to pay off his debt and so he whispered he whispered in the ear just wait a little longer his belly that scribe that teacher's belly began to rumble and just as he was about to give up what did he see bobbing along on the river but a packet wrapped in vine leaves this must be my gift, he thought. He waded into the river, picked up the packet, went out, unwrapped it, and in that packet was halva. I don't know if you've ever tasted halva. It is very, very sweet. It is made of milk and rose water and sesame seeds and honey. It's delicious, but you don't want too much. He ate the whole packet. But the packet arrived the next day, and then the next. And he was so full that he wasn't curious. Have you ever wondered where it comes from, said Hobya, wanting to move his plan on. And indeed, the scholar hadn't until the question was asked. And it's like me saying to you, don't think of a pink elephant. The minute I do, there it is. He hadn't wondered, but now that's all he could think of, and so he started to walk upstream in the direction that the packet came from. He received it earlier and earlier each day, until one day he rounded the bend, and that stream opened to a great river. And as he got closer, he saw there was an island in the middle of the river, linked to the mainland by a bridge of marble and gold. And on that island there was a beautiful, beautiful palace. And a girl, beautiful girl, hair as dark as a raven's wing, she came to the window and she threw this packet covered in vine leaves into the river. Oh, said the scholar, this beautiful woman has been moved by the creator to provide for me. I must say thank you. 
and so he went to walk over the bridge. But as he did, he was stopped by an invisible force. He could not get across. He heard sniggering. He looked behind him. There was a lot of heroes there. He could tell they were heroes because they all had blonde hair and their teeth glinted when they smiled and none of them would have looked out of place in a Disney cartoon. They said, you'll never get across there. For the, for the girl that lives there, her parents, they offended Ashmedai, king of the demons, and he's cursed the bridge, you can't get across. But he wanted to get across. He wanted to thank the girl. But that night, Hobya came. He'd been wanting to pay back his debt so much. And he said to the scholar, take this ointment and put it on your eyes. And you'll see that the bridge is guarded by demons, but they all owe me a favour. And so I will get them to let you pass. I will have paid off my debt to you. They will have paid off their debt to me. Everyone will be happy. He agreed. He put the ointment on his eyes. He walked up to the bridge. He sucked in his little pot belly as much as he could and he pulled up his trousers and he smoothed his last two remaining hairs over the top of his rather bald head. There were lots of demons there, some were on horseback, some just had really bad breath, some had cutlasses. But he trusted Hobbya and they owed him a favour and so he took the stance of a warrior. Ah! he cried and as he cried they just melted away. He crossed over the bridge and as soon as he did there was a cheer from the heroes on the bank. Hooray! they cried. There was a cheer from the women on the uh, island that had been there to look after the princess. Hooray, they cried. And then they rushed to the princess. They said, Madam, Madam, your hero has arrived. Now, what does a woman do when her hero arrives? Well, what my booba, my grandmother, used to say to me is, you put away the power tools and you titivate. You make yourself look good and then you waft like you've never wafted before. And that's exactly what the princess did. And when she saw her hero, wasn't quite what she was expecting. But he did make her laugh. And a woman really likes a man that makes her laugh. <laughs> they were married. Oh, such a wedding. I wish you could have been there. And that would be the end of the story, but for years later, Years later, when they had two fine children, the children were arguing, You hit me! No, you did this! You did that! It's not fair! And the mother pulled them apart. She said, Look, life is never fair, but life is what you make it. Years ago, she said, I overheard your father make a deal. And years ago, I knew that your father was eating halva that he thought I threw out of a window. What he didn't realise is it wasn't halva at all. This was an island. <laughs> we were very short of space. Every day I used to bathe in milk and then I would take sesame and honey and take off all the dry skin off my elbows and my knees and and then with a little milk I would mix it all together, wrap it in vine leaves and throw it in the river. <gasps> they heard a, a, a gasp from behind one of the pillars. There was the scholar, hand to his mouth, but he still had quite a taste for his wife's halva. He said, you, 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 you mean all these years I've just been eating your alluvial deposits? Well. She said, you never told me about the deal with Hobbier. I heard it. I didn't marry you because I thought you were a hero. I married you because you made me laugh. I married you because you were a good and a kind man. I married you. Well, why does a woman marry a man? They marry a man for a thousand unfathomable reasons. And when Darius had finished telling the story, he turned to the princess and she had moved into the room and there was just one tear trickling down her face. 
he looked at her and he said, What has wounded you to cause such a silence? And still she did not speak. And he took her by the hands and sat her down. He took that teardrop on the end of his finger. Let me tell you one last story, he said. And he told her the tale of three men that were travelling across the plains. A woodcarver, a tailor and a scholar. And as they travelled across those plains, well, when the sun sank, it was a dark and foreboding place. And so they found shelter in a cave, first of all checking that there were no wild animals curled up there, and they made a fire, the fire that they made in the entrance to the cave. And the firelight danced and bounced across the walls, and the mica and the quartz seemed to glitter and glow like a thousand tiny constellations held within the dome of that cave. We will take it in turns, said the woodcarver. I will go first and then each one of us will take turns to keep watch. And so it was. Now he was not used to sitting doing nothing and he had seen a, a large dead tree trunk out just outside the cave and so he dragged it inside and he took out his knife and he began to whittle. Quite soon he had made a beautiful wood carved woman. He put it in the corner of the cave and then he woke up the tailor. He said, it's your turn now, my friend, to keep watch. I'm away from my, from my rest. And when the tailor awoke, rubbing his eyes for a moment, he saw what he thought was a naked woman in the corner of the cave and very relieved to see that it was just a statue, but he thought, I must clothe that statue. <laughs> and so he took lengths of silks, garments fit for a queen, and he stitched and sewed and clothed her, and then, just for good measure, added a, a few trinkets, earrings and a necklace. And when he was satisfied with the overall effect, he woke up the scholar. He said, it's, it's your turn now, I'm away from my rest. And the scholar saw the wood-carved woman and found himself saying, What has wounded you? Why such a silence? And he began to speak. And he wove in that dark night beneath that cave of stars words. And words have power. He wove those words together until wood became bone and branch became limb and bark became skin and sap became blood. Over and over he talked until standing before him was not a woman of wood but a living, breathing woman. Such a miracle. He awoke his two travelling companions and before you know what had happened, they started to argue, the tailor and the wood carver, about who she belonged to. I made her. She was nothing but wood till I made her. I clothed her. She was naked till I clothed her and put those jewels upon her. Enough, said the scholar. Should we not ask her? quicker than I can tell you. The princess turned to Darius and said, doesn't she rather belong to the man that made her speak? But she was not so upset that she had spoken. Darius smiled back. 
And this is what I love about this story. It is nearly 5,000 years old, and many parts of it has been changed except this one phrase. Darius turns to the princess and says, Does she rather not belong to herself? When the princess heard that, she thought, This is a man I can marry. This is a man I can marry. And they talked and talked and talked until the sun began to set and it wouldn't have been seemly for he to, him to stay there. And so he went outside, but the guard, you remember the guard that was placed outside? He had fallen asleep. He hadn't heard any of the exchange. I made her speak, said Darius. I made her speak. A likely tale, he says. They all say that, sir. You were asleep, you didn't hear. I was merely resting my eyes. And so Darius was taken and he was thrown into jail to be beheaded in the morning. The princess had heard none of this. She had gone off to talk to her sisters about a wedding. And as Darius sat there, he thought, I am the unluckiest man in the world. I was the only man in Borsa that could make gold. I was the finest tailor in the city of Ur. I was the only man in Susa that could unlock the princess's lips and her heart, and yet I am to die as soon as the sun rises. It's better that I am. I would be no good for her. Bad luck has followed me everywhere. And so he was taken out in the morning. His head was placed upon the block and he breathed in. And as he breathed in, stop, said Luck. Do you remember Luck that made that deal all that time ago? On the very day he was born? Wisdom, you've had this man for 26 years now. Look what a mess you've made of it. Give him to me for 26 seconds. You'll see a change. A deal is a deal, however old it is. And so as Darius took what he thought would be his last breath, wisdom left and ho, luck entered. In that moment, as the axeman raised his axe, the princess just happened to be passing, saw the glint, turned her head, which was lucky, screamed when she saw there was a gasp from the crowd. They had never heard her scream utter anything. She said, that's my betrothed you're about to behead. They couldn't believe it. There was a wedding that day in the city of Susa that some say they thought they would never ever see. And Prince Darius, along with his wife, ruled well and wisely. If you don't believe me, you can go and look in the history books. And as for that guard, as for that guard that fell asleep, well, no one was in a mood to behead anyone that day, so he was given in marriage to a woman who never stopped talking, not even in her sleep. And as for wisdom and luck, oh, they are arguing still about who is the brightest, who is the bravest, who is the cleverest. If only they would understand that it is a wise man who makes his own luck. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening. And now I'll pass you back to Kathy. We want to thank you so much, Shauna Lay, for such beautiful telling. Thank you for staying up late with us and sharing your words. There is indeed power in words. And you have reminded us beautifully of the power of the words and the power of story. So thank you so much again. And just a reminder to you all, because Shauna Lay lives six hours apart from us, and she's, or I will say she's on a six hour delay, she will not be here at the end of our session this evening when you will have an opportunity to ask your questions or share your comments with tellers via chat.
So if you have anything for her, put it in the chat box and she can get to, you can get to ask your questions that way. So thanks again. A reminder also, if you'd like to see the interpreter along with the teller, it should work if you put your, put it, set your settings on gallery view. Now for our next teller, our next storyteller is from right up the road and across the ocean all at the same time. Bernadette Nason hails from England, lives in Austin and performs all over the world. She is an award-winning storyteller, actress, author and TCA touring artist. Where she is from, however, has never gotten in the way of where she was going or stopped her from getting there. And as you have heard her tell, if you have heard her tell, you are glad to be on the journey with her and to get to hear her tell. It has been said of Bernadette that she is a gifted writer, a skilled actress and a superb storyteller. Her beautifully crafted stories are works of art that touch your heart and make you think question, laugh, and cry all at the same time. As for me, I can just say that I love her accent and I love her stories. And oh, how I love to hear her tell. Bernadette Nason. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everyone. I am so delighted to be here tonight. I spent quite some time trying to think of what story I would tell. Um, and I suddenly remembered that uh, there were some ghost stories that I didn't get an opportunity very often to tell. And as we we're approaching Halloween, I thought I might do that. Um, when I was a little girl, I had a, a favorite book and my book was the Railway Children. I just love The Railway Children. And some of you will know that one because it was made into a movie. Um, in fact, several times, I think. And it was written by an author called E. Nesbitt. And I didn't know who E. Nesbitt was, except she was the author of my favorite book. Well, one day when I was looking for a creepy story for grown-ups, I happened to find an adult story by E. Nesbitt or Edith. Nesbitt. And it was set in England. And I was looking for a ghost story that was set in England. And so that is the one that I have decided to tell you tonight. So if you are ready, I shall begin. Although I have been told that every word of this story is true, I don't really expect people to believe it. I'm just going to tell it to you the way that I heard it. And you can be the judge. Apparently, it happened in England at the turn of the last century when Queen Victoria was still on the throne. There was a charming young couple, Michael and Laura. They had just got married and they were on their honeymoon. They were spending it at a seaside resort. And uh, one day they decided that they would travel down a little further south to a beautiful village that had a church in it. Now, most of you will know that in Victorian England, there were no um, telephones, no TVs, no radio. You, you made your own entertainment. And visiting old churches was a popular pastime in those days. Well, they had a wonderful time in this village. They spent the whole day there. It was lovely. The, the area was beautiful and quiet. And while they were out walking, they came upon a cottage that was for sale. Now, this cottage was a long, low building with unusual shaped rooms coming off it at strange angles. It had apparently been built on the remains of an old house that had once stood there. Well, it was for sale and they made up their minds there and then. It was just two miles from the church. They would buy it. Well, they moved in 
and Michael was a painter. He brought all his stuff in and Laura wrote poems and books. And uh, after they had unpacked all of their boxes and their crates, they decided to uh, bring in a housekeeper. Uh, and she was going to do all of their chores and the housework. But this lady, Mrs. Dorman, oh, she was a character. Not only did she do the work that she was supposed to do, she loved to tell them stories of smugglers and highwaymen and eerie sights that you might see on lonely starlit nights. Well, they'd been in the house for about three months and life had been going wonderfully well. When Mrs. Dorman, completely out of the blue, came to them and said that she was going to be leaving the following week. Well, Laura had no idea what was going on. She, she said to Michael, do you think that we have upset her? Do you think we might have insulted her or offended her or something? And Michael said, well, don't worry about it. I'll talk to her later and, and find out what's going on. Why don't we walk up to the church that always cheers us up and uh, we can just spend a little time there just to lift our spirits. So they set out. Now, the path to the church was um, went through the woods and over a little hillside and through two meadows before you actually reached the graveyard wall. They walked into the church and immediately those arches went right up into the darkness. And when the light shone through the windows, it, it, the stained glass windows, it was just gorgeous inside. Up towards the altar, there were two uh, slabs, stone slabs. And on each slab, there was the gray marble figure of a knight in armor. Their hands were held in prayer like this. They were easily the strangest objects in that building. The, the stones seemed to glow in the dark of the church. The names of those knights had been long forgotten, but the local peasants said they had been fierce and wicked men. Their deeds had been so foul that their house had been struck by lightning. Uh, a, a, an act of God had brought it to the ground. And by the way, that area, that was exactly where Michael and Laura's cottage was built. Well, looking at these strange stone figures and their rather evil faces, both Michael and Laura could imagine how those stories might be true. But they decided it was time to go home. They had a short rest and set out again. And when they got back to the cottage, Michael took Mrs. Dorman on one side and he asked her if, if she might tell them the reason that she was leaving. Were, was she unhappy with them? Had, had she fault to find with them? Oh, no, she said. No, no, sir. No, you've both been most kind, I'm sure. Well, why are you leaving so suddenly, Michael said, and why now? Oh, sir, well, you know, you've seen those two figures on marble in the church. Michael smiled. You mean the statues, the statues made of marble? I mean them, them figures created man size in marble, she said. On Halloween night. They do say that those figures sit up on their slabs, gets off, walks down the aisle and goes out of the door. And as the clock strikes 11, they walk across the fields and make their way to their home. Ha! Oh, to their home, Michael said. And where is that? Why, it's here, sir. This cottage, this was their home, yes, sir. 
and if they meet anyone along the way. And then she stopped talking. And Michael said, well, well, what, what? But she wouldn't say another word. But as she turned away, she said, lock your doors on Halloween night, sir. Lock them tight. I'm begging you. Well, that was it. <laughs> Michael was rather shocked by this and he chose not to tell Laura. It seemed wisest under the circumstances. He thought perhaps it might frighten her. I mean, he himself was a little shaken by it. He would wait until they'd had a quiet night at home on Halloween night, and then he would tell her the following day, when it was clear that it was a legend and it was all something of a joke. Well, sure enough, on October the 30th, Mrs. Dorman left, and she promised that she would come back to work the following week. Friday, Halloween night, Halloween day, uh, Laura and Michael worked in their house. They puttered about and everything was just fine until the sunset. When Michael noticed that Laura was beginning to get a little edgy, perhaps a little sad. And he said, my dear, is everything all right? Are you feeling okay? And she said, well, yes, but I am a little uncomfortable. I am a little nervous. I have to be honest with you, Michael, I, I feel as if something evil might happen. Well, he comforted her and they sat down by the firelight in their chairs and they read and all was well. But you know, Michael himself was quite antsy. He was restless. He wanted to smoke his pipe. And the truth was, Laura did not like it when he smoked his pipe inside the house. So he told her that he was going to step outside and just smoke a, a, a pipe's worth of tobacco and then he'd be in again. Don't be long, Laura said. Please don't be out there long. Don't worry, he told her. I'll leave the door open. I'll just leave it ajar so that you can see me here and everything is fine. So he lit up his pipe and he looked through the door and he could see his wife sifting happily in her chair, reading by the firelight. And he glanced up and he could see the tower, the tower of the church, gray and black in the cloudy sky. And then at 11 o'clock, the church clock chimed. Oh. Michael was still antsy. He'd finished his pipe. He wasn't ready for bed yet. So he decided that he would just walk up to the church because he knew that that would lift his spirits. And as he started walking through the woods, he heard a step alongside him. At least he thought he did. But when he stopped, there was no noise. So he started walking again and again. He heard some rustling in the leaves and again, when he stopped, the sound stopped too. It's an echo, it's an echo. Oh, I'm just frightening myself, he thought. Well, he carried on walking, made his way through the meadows until he got to the church. And as soon as he did, he saw that the church door was open and he immediately blamed himself. He and Laura were the only ones who ever went there during the week, other than the, the people went there on Sundays, but he and Laura were the only ones. So they must have left the door open. He went inside. He began to walk up the aisle and he was about halfway when he remembered with a sudden chill that this was the very day, the very hour that those figures were supposed to walk. Ha! He realized he was being ridiculous. He kept walking down the aisle and at that moment, the moon came out from behind the clouds and light poured into the church. And that's when he saw it. His heart beat hard. He swallowed because he could see that the marble knights were gone. 
He rushed up to those slabs. He ran his hands across them. Smooth marble. The figures were gone. Ah! And then he remembered. Laura, his dear wife, was on her own in the cottage. He had to bite the inside of his lip to stop himself from shrieking. He ran out of the church door. He jumped over the graveyard wall and he ran as fast as his legs would carry him across the fields. He went down the hillside and into the woods. He ran and ran. He was sweating now and, and his breath was rasping, but he had to get to the cottage. Well, just as he was approaching, all of a sudden, something jumped out of the ground towards him. Get away from me, keep back, he said. But then his arms were pinned above him and he heard a voice say, pull yourself together, man. And when he looked around, it was Dr. Kelly, his neighbor. I've got to get inside, he said. I've got to go and make sure my wife is all right. Oh, calm down, man, what is wrong? The marble knights, they're gone from the church. Oh, you've been listening to old wives' tales, the doctor said. Ha! Huh? Nonsense. Come with me. Stop being such a coward, man. Let's go back to the church and you show me. So something about the doctor's calm manner brought him to his senses. And Michael walked back with the doctor as fast as he could to the church. And when they got inside, he could barely look. But he heard the doctor light a match. And he heard him say, there, see, they're there, exactly as they should be. And when o Michael opened his eyes, he saw that indeed, those figures were on the slabs, exactly as they should be. <laughs> well, he felt like such a fool. I'm so sorry, Dr. Kelly, he said, I, the, the light must have tricked my eyes. And he was sheepish at this point. Well, it's all right, man. It's all right. They're back as they should be. I, I don't know what you saw. But this time, the doctor leaned down and he was looking at the, the most evil looking of those two figures. And he said, look, look here. This one's hand is broken. Michael went over and he looked. And it was. He couldn't remember noticing that the last time the two of them were in the church. He and Laura were in the church together. But, well, the hand was broken. But honestly, he didn't care about that right now. All he wanted to do was get back to his wife. It was late. He invited Dr. Kelly to come to the cottage for a nightcap. And they chatted amiably as they walked across the fields. And as they approached the cottage, Mike Michael noticed that the front door was wide open and he thought, has Laura gone out? Oh no, but then he remembered that he had left the door open so that she could see him. Oh, and he breathed a sigh of relief. He and the doctor entered the cottage. They didn't see Laura at first because she wasn't in her chair and her book and her handkerchief were on the floor but then they saw her. She was sprawled on the window seat, her head hanging to one side, her long brown hair spilling to the ground. Her mouth was pulled back, showing her teeth. Her eyes were wide, wide open, as if she had seen something terrible, and her hands were clenched like this, and one of them seemed to be holding something. Michael ran to her. Laura, he shouted, Laura. He tried to pick her up in, in his arms, but she just slumped and fell. And when he realized that she was indeed gone from him forever, he allowed the doctor to open up her hand and see what she held. It was a gray marble finger. Man Size in Marble by Edith Nesbitt. Thank you. And now I will hand you back to Kathy, hoping that Kathy is not having any kind of. There she is. <laughs> Hello. Hey, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. Thank you for that 
I, I, should I say thank you for scaring us like that? You know, <laughs> I don't usually thank people for doing that, but you did such a great job with it. Thank you for painting those pictures and with your words and your expression. Thank you. <clears throat> now, next teller is Knut Rari. Rari. I have to admit that some of the best storytelling and some of the best storytellers I've heard, and I've heard them from a lot of places, but it just seems to be that there, there are a whole lot of them who come out of North Carolina. Could it be something in the water up there or in the soil that grows such fine storytellers or something in the mountain air that gets the imagination going and the mouth to telling? Whatever it is, we're grateful for it and for those who share. Canute is our next teller. He may be North, from North Carolina, but you might mistake him from being, as being from Texas. If you ever see him at the Tejas Festival, he's always there and ready to lend a helping hand, whatever the hand is that is needed. Canute has a lifelong love of story and the oral tradition. His family would say he was always, he's always been a storyteller. He's told stories, he says, from courthouse steps in Jonesboro to NPR story slams in Asheville and places in between, telling stories and planting seeds to create opportunities for others to hear and tell stories as well. Whether starting or working with festivals, storytelling groups or setting up new venues. Canute credits, as do many, Elizabeth Ellis with helping him find his storytelling voice. He says, she opened the door to that canary cage and the bird flew out. All I can add to that is, we sure are glad she did. Here's Canute. Oh, thank you so much for that, that uh, gracious um, uh, introduction. Um, and I'm, it's wonderful to be with y'all tonight to, to tell a story. When I was a little boy, I learned a lot of lessons from the dogs that we had in our life. My brothers and I, my brother Fred was seven at the time and I was five and my younger brother was three. And we had dogs around us. We had yard dogs and barn dogs and house dogs and lap dogs and working dogs. And one of those working dogs that we had that, that I, I'll never forget, and particularly when I'm around uh, the farm and I smell the smells coming uh, off the hay fields and off the, um, out of the barnyard, I think of old Sport. Now Sport, Sport was an incredible dog. For us boys, we could throw a stick or throw rocks all day long and Sport would go out there and get them and bring them back and go out and get them and bring them back and go out and get them and bring them back. And they were just never could wear that energy out that dog had. Now that dog could run and jump over a gate or a fence in a single bound. That dog was so incredible. You, she worked with my grandpa and my father and they would go out in the field and that dog would go out in the field and circle and circle around cows and pigs and sheep and bring those animals back in a single file. And for little boys like us, that dog was a wonder dog, an incredible dog. Now part, part Lassie, part Rin Tin Tin, part Scooby-Doo, that was sport. But not all dogs are, are sport. Not all dogs are working dogs. And we had some yard dogs. Now a yard dog, yard dog is one of those dogs that just shows up one day. It shows up one day. Now it may have been thrown out of a car by somebody who didn't want it, or maybe it just ran away from home someplace because it was tired of being beaten and kicked around. But they show up at our house and we were always ready to feed them. And that dog, we'd adopt them and take them in. But a yard dog, a yard dog really did only three things. A yard dog begged and slept and ate. And sometimes they chase cars. Now I said they chase cars, I didn't say they caught cars. One of those dogs we had was a dog we called Bear. Old Bear would head out across the yard, across the road, down the ditch, running after cars as hard as it could. Now, 
a car goes 40 or 50 or 60 miles an hour past our house back in the day. And when it did, old bear chasing it as hard as it could, couldn't come anywhere near catching a car. Sometimes it chased trucks. Now, trucks, trucks went 20 or 30, 40 miles an hour. And that dog, when it went out across the yard and down through the road and down through the ditch and running as hard as it could with that, with tar and dirt and dust flying up in its face and ended up in a huddle at the end of the ditch because it couldn't catch a truck either. But that didn't mean that, uh, that didn't mean that Bear gave up. You know, but at the point where it had had so much tar and so much stone and so much dirt thrown in its face, it could barely walk. And that's one of the reasons why we called it Bear because it could pretty much barely walk or barely talk or barely eat or barely bark. But old Bear never gave up. One afternoon we were sitting there and uh, we were playing actually in the front yard, my brothers and I, we'd been sitting on a step and we were out there playing. Old Sport was over underneath the tree, all curled up after working all day. And old Bear was sitting on its spot. Now it had a spot, we'll call it, in a bear's mind, that spot was point A, kind of had a formula to work with, point A. And it would look up on the, the rise up there out on the highway, and it would that would be point B, and that would be where it would see that car or that truck coming up, and it would run as hard as it could to try to get to it at point C where it could bite on that tire. Well, it was sitting there that afternoon on point A, looking up there at point B when we boys suddenly caught, where Bear caught our attention. Bear sat up all of a sudden and looked up at point B, looked up at point B, and for the first time and we'd ever seen it in Bear's eyes, there was hope. Bear was looking toward point B and we suddenly could hear what Bear heard Kachugga, 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 kachugga. Up over that rise came Farmer Johnson and on his big John Deere tractor, and he was to a, pulling two enormous loads of hay, like two semi-tractor trailers full of hay on that old tractor. He was pulling those hay, bay, hay up over that, and it was just chugging and straining and chugging and straining, maybe 10 miles an hour coming over that rise. And he had the brake on trying to control it as Farmer Johnson drove that tractor down through there. And old Bear, old Bear took off across that yard. Took off across that yard and across the road and down the ditch, his teeth wide open. He had his tongue was flying and there was saliva going everywhere. And he was right up there, right at point C when that tractor got to point C. And for the first time in his life, at a point he'd never been at before, without hesitation, he bit down on that tire. He bit down on that tire, and for the next thing he knew, he's a biting down and holding on, and all of a sudden that rubber lets go on that tire, and he flies off to the left, flies off to the left and bounces off the mailbox in the ditch bounces back up onto the front end of that tractor and he's trying to hold on for himself. He's trying to get a hold of a place to stop and he's got his hands on the cap on the fuel tank and it unscrews and sprays fuel all over Bear. Bear slides back and hits the exhaust pipe right there, right there on that John Deere and holds on to it for just a microsecond because at 2000 degrees at the time, it branded John Deere right up and down his front and he slid on back and landed in Farmer Johnson's lap. At that moment in time, Farmer Johnson's trying to hold on that tractor because it's got a flat tire now and he can't hardly steer it. And he knocks old Bear to the side and Bear hits that fender on the side of the tractor. Drops back down on the tongue that's holding the tractor to the first wagon and grabs the pin. And as he did, that pin pops out and that tongue drops down on the ground and it starts to sparking and sparks are flying. And all of a sudden old Bear, burst into flames. Now in the sphere of totally I'm okay all the time, Bear was not so okay, he was on fire. And he let go of that pin and he bounced off the, the tire on the front end of that first wagon. And he ricocheted back and bounced off the tire on the left side of that wagon on the first wagon. And he bounced up onto the tongue that was holding the first wagon to the second wagon, grabbed that pin and as he did, he got his collar caught on that pin and slipped on back and slid all the way underneath that wagon. And it sprung him back and threw him up against the back of the first wagon and he bounced into the air. And as he did, 
that flaming furry ball of dog made a big old arc. And just about that time, there was a lady driving down the road. She was about to pass that, that tractor with pulling those two old wagons. And she looks up and there comes this flaming furry dog right at her. And she, you can see her inside that car and all you can see is. And at that moment, old bear is still coming at her heading for that windshield. Sport jumps up from under that tree and runs into the house. Runs right back out under one paw, he's got a cushion from the couch in the living room. And under the other, on the other paw, he's got a bucket. And he runs by the well, he scoops up a bucket of water, runs across the yard, runs out onto the road, jumps up on that first wagon, jumps into the air, throws water onto Old Bear, putting that fire out, grabs Old Bear and continues to fly over the side of the wagon. Well, my brother Fred, my brother Ike and I, we are stunned. We don't know what's happened on the other side, the disaster, the chaos. We're just terrified at the possibilities, but we ran out there to see what it looked like. Well, Farmer Johnson was sitting there putting his tractor and he was sweating and trying to just get over the fact he got the wagon stopped and the tractor stopped. We ran past that woman sitting in that car and she was sitting there just, oh, she was okay, but she was sobbing, trying to get herself together. Went around the back of that car, looked down that ditch and there, there they were. Sport holding that cushion right there in his lap. And on top of that cushion was old Bear. Bear was sitting there, big old piece of tire in his mouth, and he was just smoking and smiling. Well, we boys, we, we learned a couple of things that day. One of those lessons from our dogs, one of them was just what a great wonder dog Sport really was and a fantastic rescue dog. And we learned from old Bear that if you set your sights high enough, you make some goals and you make a plan and you practice and practice and practice and practice. You too can accomplish anything you set yourself out to do. Now, another dog in our lives was a little dog named Chewy. But you got to know a little bit of the background about this. He was grandma's dog. That's what grandma thought. But Chewy, Chewy thought grandma was his human. If you got anywhere near grandma, sitting there in her lazy boy chair there in the living room, well, Chewy would let you know that you better get not to get too close because there'd be a growl and a little bark and maybe a nip if you got too close. Now, Grandma was sitting there in that living room chair because she discovered the black and white TV that we finally got out there on the farm. And she loved her little dog, Chewy. But she, she'd kind of given up on cooking. Now, Grandma had probably been a great cook at one point in time. You know, she had had my mother, who was her daughter. And my mother had just died recently, and we'd moved to live with my grandmother and my, my grandfather, Grandpa Schweitzer, Grandma Rary. So uh, Grandma Schweitzer and Grandma, uh, uh, Grandpa Schweitzer. And when we went to live with them, we found out about that black and white TV. And we also found out that Grandma really didn't cook the way she used to. She wasn't that kind of grandma that would make cookies and cakes and things like that. She really just really didn't care about cooking at all anymore. She actually blew up uh, some tea kettles full of water a few times and when we always took the trash down to the and down to the field and the, the woods and the, periodically we'd see those kettles and they're all blown up and kind of smile because grandma just wasn't much of a cook. We didn't expect too much from her. She'd raised a family. She'd had my mother and her daughter and she'd had my Aunt Arlene and my Uncle John and Grandpa to feed a farm family all that time. But by this time, by the time we lived with her, she didn't really cook too much anymore. But she did take care of the garden. So when we boys went to live with her, at that point, my brother Fred was about nine and my brother uh, Ike was about uh, uh, six and I was right in there about eight. You know, Ike was about five. And uh, Ike really was too young to go down and do chores at the barn. Uh, Fred and Ike and I did. We'd take care of the cows and the sheep and the pigs. And, and, but Ike, they, they assigned Ike to the garden to help Grandma in the garden. And, and they assigned him, her to the, him to the strawberry patch. 
and uh, to take care of the strawberry patch. They'd sit him down there and he would weed the strawberry patch. And he really loved uh, weeding the strawberry patch because he could eat strawberries. And he started to eat a strawberry here and a strawberry there and another strawberry and another strawberry and another strawberry. And uh, he began to like strawberry pie and he began to like strawberry cake and he liked strawberry shortcake. He liked strawberries with sugar and strawberries with cream and eating strawberries anyway, and strawberry jam, strawberry preserve, preserve. And we got to the point where we were beginning to wonder whether Ike was maybe addicted to strawberries. Well, one day my brother Ike and Fred and I got off the big yellow bus that brought, a home, brought us home from school. And we were walking up through the barnyard and all of a sudden Ike started jogging ahead of us, running up uh, through the barnyard and up the sidewalk, up the steps into the house. And as he did, uh, Fred and I wondering what was going on could smell suddenly uh, fumes from the kitchen. And we could tell that there was strawberries and they were in distress. And Ike at this point had made it into the living room and was running toward the kitchen to see what he could do to rescue those strawberries because he didn't want them hurt. And as he did, he ran past that chair that grandma was sitting in and right there was Chewy on top of grandma's lap. Now Chewy was chewing on something, that's how Chewy got her name. We kind of don't try to think about that too much, but brought her back to attention when Ike started running by her. And as he ran by her, old Chewy jumps off the couch thinking grandma's in trouble, jumps out of that chair, out of her lap, and bites down as hard as he can on that leg of Ike's blue jeans. But he missed the leg and just, just clamped right down on the blue jean leg, fortunately for Ike. But Ike never stopped a bit. He kept running and running and running into the kitchen, around the corner. And as he did, he saw it. There it was a pressure cooker. The pressure cooker was red hot. It was red hot. And the pressure regulator on the top of that pressure cooker was just pop, 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 pop. Ike didn't stop for a minute. He grabbed up that mitt that was laying on the counter and he grabbed a hold of that handle of that pressure cooker. Just as he grabbed a hold of that handle, that pressure cooker regulator, which was popping, 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 let go and blasted up through the bottom of the cabinet right through the bottom of the cabinet, right through the top of the cabinet, right through the attic, right through the roof, and on up into the sky, and headed out there up into the sky, up into space, and it's probably still going today, and we're pretty sure there are people down and down out there in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado out there watching it as it goes now, and we're not gonna be surprised if someday they name a star after whatever has happened to that pressure cooker regulator. But I didn't stop with that. He, he ran out the back door with that pressure cooker and he saw a big old bucket of cold water right there on the, there beside the corner of the house. No, Chewy is still hanging on to Ike's leg. And as Chewy is hanging on Ike's leg and Ike has got that pressure cooker, Ike shoves that pressure cooker down in there. He get those, that straw, draw strawberry jam down and make cool it off real fast. But I had not read that label that says do not cool uh, do not cool rapidly on the side of that pressure cooker. And when he slammed it into that cold water, that pressure cooker blew up and spread strawberry jam all over Ike and all over Chewy and blew them up in the air, bouncing off the woodshed, off the outhouse, off the milk house, and off the barn into the air in a big old arc hidden for the back of the farm. As that arc continued up into the sky, he bashed through a group, a herd, a flock of southbound geese, knocking to the right and to the left and up and down, feathers everywhere, sticking to Chewy and chickens, chicken, sticking to Ike as he heads on up into the air in that big arc. And as they head toward the back, he slams across the windshield of a barnstorming pilot that was passing by. And as he did, that barnstorm pilot called in and said, there must have been a bird strike. I've got this smear of red and feathers all over the front of my screen and kept going to keep that train, train under control. And as he did, that arc of Ike and Chewy continued down toward the woods in the back of the farm. And as they did, they landed in the top of a fir tree that used to be a Christmas tree that had planted by the family a long time ago and caused that fir tree to sling back and throw Chewy and Ike back into the woods. Well, they skipped across a pond that we'd made back there and skipped across into the woods and tumbled through the branches and the leaves and the trees and bounced back into the woods and stopped. And as they did, old Ike got up with the pressure cooker in one hand and 
and Chewie still on his leg, and two hunters that were hiding in their blind, fall, had fallen asleep, woke up, looked down range, saw Ike and Chewie, and as they did, they emptied both their rifles, bing, 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 all toward Chewie and Ike. And at the time, Ike threw up that pressure cooker, bouncing those shells, bing, 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 knocking all those shells down to the ground. And at that moment, as he had that pressure cooker way up there, the last jar of strawberry jam spiraled out of the pressure cooker heading toward the ground. Ike saw that with his wide eyes. He looked down at Chewie and he yelled at Chewie, Chewie, let go of my leg, Chewie, let go of my leg. Let go of my leg, catch that jar, Chewie, catch that jar. Well, old Chewie looks up, lets go, does a pirouette in the air, lays down on his back right there and catches that jar in his arms just like a football player, an NFL receiver right there on the goal line, just catching that, catch that touchdown to win the game. Oh, Ike yells to Chewy, great, good dog, Chewy, good dog, good dog. Let's get out of here, Chewy. He gives up that jar from Chewy, and Chewy and Ike run up the lane between the cornfields, heading back toward the house. Chewy's a little bit ahead of Ike, runs in the barnyard, up the sidewalk, up the steps, in the living room, jumps up on grandma's lap, does a couple of circles around and around, lays back down. We're not even sure that grandma realized that Chewie was gone yet because her favorite TV show was on TV. And I came running up the lane, came up running through the barnyard, came running up through the steps, up into the door, past the living room, past the kitchen, downstairs in the fruit cellar, and he put that last jar, strawberry jam, up there on the top of that shelf, just to smile and knowing that he'd gotten his strawberry jam ready for winter and he got a had one ready to go well that day we it certainly verified for us that ike ike had a definitely had a addiction to strawberry jam and from old chewy from old chewy we learned that you can teach an old dog new tricks and there's a couple of things that i learned from our dogs when I was a child. Thank you, Knut. <laughs> you know, the, I have another storytelling friend in North Carolina and I, have, I said to her on occasion that sometimes I think things just happen to folk because they are the right ones to tell about it. Either that or they get just enough of it that they can add the rest of the truth to it and tell it for true. <laughs> Thank you, Knut, for that. Now we come to our next storyteller who will close us out for the evening. It's one thing to have a dream or plant a seed and it's another to watch it grow and another all together to see it come to full bloom. Our next teller has, is J.B. Keith and he has been with TSA from the very beginning from the dream to the coming to full fruition. He has not only lived to tell about it, but helped to make it happen. JB is a founding member of Tejas and the Dallas Storytelling Guild. He's a past president of Tejas and a John Henry Falk awardee. He describes his original stories as the divergent wondering of an undisciplined mind on the brink of chaos. Some of us might be sitting there with you in this time of Corona. He was at the very first festival, was part of the lineup for the 35th earlier this year, and just, just before we went down into lockdown, and he is now here with us this evening to share with us in this time of Corona. I guess you might say it's only fitting that he who was there in the beginning might be here with us to give us his spin and help us bring tonight's concert to an end. J.B. Keith. Thank you, Kathy. It was late. The day was getting on. It was somewhere between half past twilight and a quarter to dusk. I was on my front porch, small porch, barely, barely large enough for you to change your mind. Two is a crowd. And three is a mob that can get you a fire marshal, marshal citation for overcrowding. Sometimes I think my front porch 
is a front stoop, simply masquerading as a porch. A different breeze was nudging white cloud puffs across a canopy of periwinkle blue. The lead cloud looked a lot like Snoopy wearing a derby hat. He was followed by Woodstock and his scout troop. They were headed in the direction of Lake Raybob to rendezvous with an early rising moon. Behind me, the door opened and closed and Judy, the woman whose husband I am, came through and said, stop, don't move. I froze, which is hard to do in Denton just about any time of year nowadays. I looked down. Where my foot would have landed had I taken the next step was a small baby bird, mostly down, looking up at me with adoring, uncritical eyes. He had very few feathers and what feathers he had were awry. And he was clearly having a bad feather day, having been ejected prematurely from his nest. Judy said, we'll have to name him. I said, name him? Why in the world would we name him? A strange bird on our, on our front stoop. He may already have a name. What is your name, little bird? Beep. See, he has a name, Peep. Hello, Peep. Peep, I'd like you to meet Judy. Judy, this is Peep. Judy said, don't be silly. If birds name themselves, all birds would be named Peep. Well, what would you name him? I don't know, how about Dickie Bird? Dickie Bird. Dickie Bird is a silly name. Why, half of all the macaws, cockatoos, and parakeets in captivity are named Dickie Bird. Surely you can come up with a better name than that. Not at the moment. I said, besides, naming a bird may be, we don't need anything, we don't know anything about bird world. If we name a bird, that may be tantamount to adoption. And then we would have to rear the bird. They would have to school the bird, go to bird teacher parent meetings. And what if he wants to go to college and then law school? Bird seed ain't cheap, you know. Besides, we are dog people. Caninus preferentius. Our dog would never abandon us. Why should we abandon our dog? I don't know whether bird people and dog people can be one and the same. Bird people are different from you and me. We don't know any bird people. We know bird brain, sure, we live in Denton, college town. Bird people have library cards. Bird people go to the library. Bird people check out books, not read, enjoy, and forget books, but read, ponder, and remember books. Books on the arcane differences between a yellow-shafted flicker and a yellow-bellied sapsucker. As for me, I couldn't tell a canary in a cage unless the canary in the cage had a name tag that said, hello, I'm a canary in the cage. And if we become bird people, what do we do with all of our cat friends? We've only within the last 10 years been able to peacefully coexist with cat friends. Cats stalk birds, cats catch birds, Cats eat birds. And when cats are not stalking, catching, and eating birds, they fantasize about stalking, catching, and eating birds. I don't know whether I could bring myself to send a get well card to a cat person if the cat person became ill. And I'm not sure I could find enough kindness in my heart to care if the cat person's bird-eating cat 
became ill, whether it regained its health. We would have to remove cat people and their cats from our Christmas card list. Judy said that I would spread what I was shoveling beneath the roses that she wouldn't have to fertilize again for at least 10 years. I said, five at the most. But I pressed on. I said, look, you want to call him Dickie Bird, he wants to be called Peep. Dickie Bird is a silly name. What about when he, I mean, you may think that's fun and an, a cute name while he's young, but what about when he's old, living in a nursing home without any teeth, drinking room, room worm, worm's wheel through a straw? And she said, Birds don't have teeth. I said, I know that, but you know what I mean. Look, he wants to be called Pete, and you want to call him Dicky Bird. Why don't we compromise and call him Dicky Pete? And so we did. About that time, his mother flew up and gave me a piece of her mind, and I asked her to please not talk with an insect in her mouth because we wanted Dickie Peep to have better manner, manners. It was time for us to go to our, on our evening walk, and Dickie Peep was toddling on his little toothpick skinny legs right in front of me, and I was fearful of stepping over him and, or going around him because I didn't want him to run under my foot. I was afraid that would not make a good impression. So we decided to go out the back door for our walk, and then we returned to the front door, and Dicky Peak was over underneath the hedges, already sound asleep. We went into the house. I took a sampler that had a nest of cardinals in the fork of a tree with the mother dangling a worm above them, and the inscription was Home Tweet Home. I cross stitched the sampler took it outside and hung it on the limb above where Dickie Peep was sound asleep. The next morning, when I went out to get the newspaper, Dickie Peep was in the middle of the street. His mother was on the opposite curb with a grasshopper drumstick dangling from her lower beak. She had lured him there, I'm sure. But Dickie Pete was right in the middle of the street. And I hollered at him. I said, hey, get out of the street. I said, you see that big blue van in that car down there? And I didn't know whether developmentally he could tell the difference. But I said, you see that big blue van? When that big blue van runs over tiny walking bird, tiny walking bird goes squish. Squish is bad. You only get one squish in life. And then it's here lies Dickie Peep, permanently put to sleep. You become nothing but a bloody black and blue bird blot on the boulevard of life. I went back in the house and I told Judy I was concerned about Dickie Peep. He seemed a little slow. She asked me to describe what I was referring to. I thought maybe that we ought to take him down to Dallas to see an orn ornithologist. And as I explained his behavior, she said, well, Males just develop more slowly than females. And that he was much further along at his age than I was when I was his age. Which was true, of course. I didn't have my first insect until I was, oh, about six months old. And I was a toddler before I had my first worm. And believe you me, boys and girls, no matter how old you get, 
you never forget your first one. The next day, Dickie Peep was outside the garage door. We had had a storm. It was raining. And I went outside to close the side gate. And as the door went up, Dickie Peep was standing right there at my feet. Well, good morning. I see you had enough sense to get in out of the street and enough sense to come in out of the rain. A bird of great potential. You might even run for office. Senator Bird has a ring to it. But on the other hand, if you have enough sense to get in out of the street and come in out of the rain, you are probably overqualified to run for Congress. About that time, Dickie Peep decided to hop into the garage. I said, no, you can't stay in the garage. When I close the door, your mother will think you've been bird napped. Said your picture will appear on milk cartons in grocery stores all over town with my name and phone number, and I'll be getting false bird calls morning, noon, and night. I was just about to get the broom and because he had run underneath the car and sweep him out when I heard the worm wagon. A local Robin has the Worms Are Us franchise. And as he comes into the neighborhood, he has a calliope that he plays and he's, it has the tune when the red, red Robin comes bob, bob, bobbing along. He has 27 different varieties of worms. Well, actually he only has nine, but he serves worms in a cone, worms in a cup, and worms on a stick. All the birds in the neighborhood flocked to the worm wagon. I went down and told the, the robin that I would like a worm on a stick. For any of you who are interested, the worm on the stick is on the menu. It's called the Hemingway because it's a, a movable feast. I took the Hemingway up and gave it to Dickie Peep and lured him out of the garage. Ran back up, closed the door. A few days later, Dickie Peep had grown, was hopping around in the lower limbs of the hedges. And clearly he was thinking about flying. So as his father, it was my duty to teach him to fly. I made me a pair of wings out of a large piece of cardboard, two large pieces that my storm door had come in. I, I cut them out and attached bungee cards to them took a magic marker and simulated feathers all over them. They weren't quite up to Icarus standards, but I had no intention of going anywhere near the sun. I figured that I could circle the yard and Dickie Peep would follow along behind me. His genetic predisposition would kick in and he would begin to fly. I had the wingspan of a California condor. And I began to circle the yard. And Dickie Pete began to circle the yard behind me. I flapped my wings. He flapped his wing, but he did not take off. So I decided I'd circle again. So I circled again. I got a rock in my shoe and I started limping. When I looked back, Dickie Peep was limping too. Have you ever seen a mocking bird. Clearly, I needed more height. Just circling the yard, flapping my wings was not going to do it for Dickie Peep. I just I got my six foot step ladder out of the garage, set it up, climbed up to the top of the step ladder. 
I don't know whether it was my rickety ladder or if it was a sudden gust of hurricane force wind. But I was precipitously propelled from my perch. And due to the incredible swiftness of falling in less than a nanosecond, which is no time at all, I found myself having a close personal relationship with the ground. When I opened my eyes, Dickie Pete was standing about six and three quarters inches from the end of my nose, looking very solicitous and concerned. The ladder, obviously, was not tall enough. I figured I would probably have to get up on top of the house, go up to the, the apex, run down the slant, curl my toes over the edge of the eave, leap into space, circle the oak tree, and come in for hopefully a two-point landing. put my extension ladder up against the eave over the porch, tossed my wings up on the roof, and began climbing up upon the roof. Now, I had been vaguely aware that there were sirens in the distance, and that they seemed to be getting louder. Unbeknownst to me, a neighbor, a neighborhood busybody just up the street had called 911 and said that the crazy old coot that lived on the corner had gone as batty as a bed bug belting bourbon straight from a bottle of Jim Beam. And if they didn't come quickly, he was going to kill himself. As I got up onto the roof and re-put re my hands into my bungee cords, was sitting there, a fire truck, an emergency medical vehicle, and three squad cars converged in front of my house and along the street on the side. An officer got up, came over and climbed up halfway up the ladder, asked me what I thought I was doing. I said, I'm teaching my bird to fly. I'm homeschooling is protected under the constitution and it's time for him to learn to fly. Dickie Peep had hopped back up to the top of the stepladder and was sitting on top of the stepladder. And when I said I was teaching him to fly, he flapped his wings and flew from the top of the stepladder over to a limb, a lower limb on the oak tree. The officer looked at me and looked at the bird and looked back at me and he said, that bird? I looked at the bird and I looked at the officer and I said, that bird? The bird looked at the officer and looked at me and he just shrugged. The officer said, well, looks like you're doing a great job. Have a nice day. I said, thank you, officer. Thank you very much. Days later, when I went out, Dickie Pete was nowhere to be found. He had just up and disappeared. He had taken his sampler with him, the home tweet home sampler. So he apparently just moved out. It was time for him to be on his own. It was weeks, then months, then three or four months. And finally, finally, we got a, a picture postcard from Dickie Pete. He was on Padre Island on the bow of a boat amidst a bevy of beauties. Under one wing, he had a brown breasted titmouse. Under the other, he had a common tern. And in his lap sat a Mexican chickadee. And he said, having a wonderful time. Wish you were here. 
and it was signed. Not Pete, not Dickie Pete, not Dickie Bird, but it was signed Richard P. Bird. I have to go now, Kathy. I'm expecting my grandbirds early in the morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, JB, for that. I would say now that's one tall tale, one that's on steroids, and if you will, even with wings. <laughs> now, didn't I tell you, folk, at the beginning, I assured you that this evening you were going to find something delightful on the menu and something truly satisfying to the palate. We have certainly had a delicious variety of, of tales this evening. And I wanna give thanks, or we want to thank all of our storytellers who have served us up with such generous helpings this evening. Once again, we want to acknowledge Shauna Lay, Bernadette, Canute, JB, Libby, and Joel. Well, again, thanks folks for joining. Thanks tellers for telling. And uh, let's keep hope alive. Let's keep story alive. It's going to help us make it through this time and the rest of time. All right.